Welcome everyone to what we promised to be another um, wonderful, exciting and engaging Zoom call uh, presented by Black Classic Press. We have been on a roll with these Zoom calls since the pandemic and they've been absolutely wonderful and allowed everyone to just stay in contact and stay in touch. Um, and tonight is going to be interesting. We expect to go the full time, 6 p.m. Eastern until eight. So please plan to be here the whole time. My name is Natalie Stokes-Peters. I work with Paul Coates at Black Classic Press. I'm gonna be background. I'm sort of your host, but if there's anything you're having technical problems or anything, just put a note in the chat to Natalie and we will make sure that we try to work through any issues that you are having. Um, just so that you know, everyone is on mute because we expect a pretty large quantity of folks to be on the call tonight. And that's the best way for us to be able to make sure everybody is able to hear. Um, we will be doing what we're going to ask is that if you have questions as we go through the presentation tonight, is that you put those questions in the chat. And then um, we have Ms. Roz Coates and Ms. April Chenier on deck who will be monitoring <laughs> those questions and capturing them. So when we reach points in the conversation that we're able to take questions or comments, that's when we'll do that um, at that point in time. So please, please, please know that the chat is your friend <laughs> and that we are watching it, <laughs> okay? With that, I'm not gonna delay a whole lot more. I am gonna turn the call over to um, Wangaza Bandeli. Wangaza is the publisher of the Black Magnificent Life newsletter. If you're on our mailing list, um, you probably get this, this email, this newsletter monthly full of wonderful Black stories. I always put it great Black news because that's exactly what it is. It's great Black news. And um, if you're not on our mailing list, you might want to get on it. So <laughs> with that, I am going to turn the call over to Wangaza who will open this meeting properly. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Natalie, and, and thanks to, to all of we who have gathered. I am privileged to simply recognize what is in our tradition. And so recognizing that we have yet another opportunity, another day, another breath, another heartbeat that allows us to gather and to come together in the way that we are, I am going to say what I know is, and that is we are so grateful to great God Almighty, known by many names, Odumakama, Oludumare, Inyame, uh, Muntu. By many names, we thank great God Almighty. And to our great deities, our Bosum, our Orishas, our deities, those angelic forces that walk and guide us, we say thank you. And because we know that any conversation of significance any gathering of people of African descent that is complete, it includes an invitation for our ancestors to join us. And so we invite you now, each of you who have joined us via Zoom today, we, we invite you in this moment to remember and to call the names of your ancestors, our ancestors, not just any ancestors, but let us honor and call forth the spirit of those precious life-giving, those those life-saving, those venerated ones who once walked this earth and whose works and deeds cause you, cause me, cause we to be as great as we are. Those who I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Whisper their names now, quietly. Write their names in the chat. If you feel so, use all caps because that says what it says, right? If you want to call them like that, do so now. Remember their faces. Call now, if you would, the names of the family members who loved and nurtured you, those who cared for you, cared about you, who protected you, who helped and prepared you to have the character, to have the self-regard, to have the insights, the understanding, and just good old sense that caused you to show up in this circle today. That you didn't have to be here. There's a whole lot that's not. Who inspired you? Call those names, those, those national, those historic heroes and sheroes who gave you and who still gives you example and demonstration of the great that you are and the greater that you can be. And especially for this gathering, thank them for Asada, for Asada Shakur, 
for guiding and for protecting her, for keeping her free. Thank you for, especially for the spirit of her grandmother who we know helped guide her to freedom. And we give thanks to the ancestors who have and continue to keep Donna Merch, yes, Donna Merch steady. Those people, those spirits, those energies, steady in her work to, to write and, and, and research and, and, and to bring us the memory and the analysis as our medicine. We need you, we need your work so badly. We thank the ancestors for you, Donna. And we are thankful for this gathering, for Paul Coates, for Natalie and the entire Black Classic Press staff and family, all who made this evening possible. And now that our ancestors are invited into the circle to be with us, to, to keep us connected, to allow us to be one, we are ready to proceed as one, whole again. Midasipa, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Wangasa. You're welcome. <clears throat> Good. Natalie, thank you so much, Wangasa. Thank you so much. Uh, Wangasa is our steady. Uh, Wangasa provides us with our guidance into our programs and she also strengthens us uh, when we're out of the program. She shows up when I forget <laughs> that we need that guidance. Thank you so much, sister. Look, before we get far away from the moment that when Gaza has brought us to, I'm gonna ask us to extend it just a little bit. I'm gonna ask us to uh, take a, uh, a moment of silence we have a lot of um, loss around us, particularly during this pandemic that I would like for us to uh, bring those who have left us present. But just as important, just as important in a contemporary sense, we have a lot of, a lot of Panthers on this call, people who know spirits that have left us, and I ask you to drop names into the chat of those who have left us as we take a moment of silence. I ask you to drop into the chat the names of those who are still incarcerated, who are still fighting, who are still struggling to be here on this plane with us. And so we're gonna bring those planes together and take just another moment of, of silence to welcome their spirits, to bring their spirits into this discussion and have their guidance and be blessed by their guidance and a recognition of them. So let's take a moment to do that, please. Please, uh, we can continue with the names. I thank everyone. We can um, we can continue with the names throughout this call, okay? <laughs> because because those those spirits got our back. They got us covered. And if 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 at a place in this in this call, uh, one of them reach out and touch you, and and they touch your mind just like someone just did for me in this moment, drop them in the chat, you know, make them present. So we're gonna have a, a, a great call this morning. Our calls, our Zoom calls are usually really, really good because they tend to be organic. They have a purpose obviously, but they tend to be organic. Our major purpose in, in bringing this call into being was that we want to take this moment and we want to um, bring Brother Sundiata. 
bring Brother Sundiata present. And it, we need to do this. We need to do this. Sophia and I, and we're going to introduce Sophia in a few minutes, but Sophia and I have talked about this a number of times, how great it would be to do a call. And we were just trying to uh, put it together in a way that we, that we don't have a call of just mourning, that we have a call of, of joy and that we have a call of delight. And I should tell you guys that that's what we're going to, that's what the intention of this call is. This is not anybody's pity party. We're going to celebrate really those individuals, those groups, those people that we talk about, and we're going to do it in a way that we're all together and we're going to share. Um, I would love this to be a wide open conversation. Unfortunately, we can't do that um, because some people like Paul Coates, they would just go on and on and on. So rather than do that, we are going to mute the conversation <clears throat> to some extent and expect you and request that you put <clears throat> your comments in the chat. Like Natalie said, we have people watching the chat and um, at different times we'll be able to um, deal with pulling stuff from the chat. Nat, I hope that you will take a few minutes at some point. Traditionally, what we do is recognize uh, people, particularly black classic press, press authors that we can, and recognize other people who are in the audience um, that, that we can get recognition to. Um, so hopefully in a little bit, Nat will be able to do that as we, as we come to a break or something. Sure. Paul, let me ask one thing. Sure. Can you back up from the camera just a little bit? Like I'm okay. getting your eyes. I'm only getting partial of your face. And so I don't know if that's everybody or just me, but if you back up. Okay. Is bit. that better? It's a little bit better. Yes. Just a little bit. Okay. Well, mine, I'm, I'm clear. Okay. Okay. That's good right there. Thank How you. is that? That's better. Okay, for those of you who only got my eyes, you only got my eyes now. Hopefully you got the whole joint, okay? So with that, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin by introducing um, Sophia Elijah. And I'm going to um, do a, most of the people on this call, or many of the people on this call, certainly know this sister because she has been uh, hard in the fight for a long, long time. And I just have, I'm gonna read this, so bear with me. Sophia Lajay is an activist, organizer, lawyer, and former law professor. For over 40 years, she has represented numerous revolutionaries and political prisoners, including Kwame Touré, Marilyn Buck, the San Francisco A, Jihad Abdul, Mamia, Mamid, I'm sorry, and Sundiata Akoli. She is a lead member of the Bring Sundiata Akoli Home Alliance, a national campaign working to free him. So what we're gonna do as a start off is have Sophia welcome her really, and have her talk a little bit about uh, the campaign to free Sundiata, where we are right now, and any other insights that she wants to share. We're going to transition from um, Sophia's comments. We're going to transition and introduce Charles Jones and Donna Birch. All of this is all of this, as as people on this call know, is connected. And as we talk, you'll see more of the connections. And um, with that, Sophia, are you unmuted? And can you come in with us? I am unmuted and I am here. Are okay. you able to hear me? I hear you and Ned, I have the spotlight on me. That's the only thing that, that would go ahead. Uh, Sophia, you should be great. Okay. Well, first I wanna thank you, Paul and everyone behind the scenes with Black Classic Press for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to speak about one of our warriors and dedicated freedom fighters, um, Sundiata Akoli. Sundiata is 85 years old, and this May 2nd will mark the 49th year of his incarceration. 
As most of the people watching today know, he is Asada Shakur's co-defendant and he has been held in, although serving a New Jersey sentence, he's been held in federal custody since 1979. He's currently in FCI Cumberland, Maryland. I just saw him last week. Um, his health is failing. Currently, his legal case is that he's been denied release on parole eight times by the New Jersey Parole Board. He is um, has case of appeal of his denial before the New Jersey Supreme Court it's pending right now. We're expecting a decision any week. Um, we will also be planning to file a clemency petition to Governor Phil Murphy. Uh, but first we want to see, and we're hoping that the New Jersey Supreme Court will follow the law. If it follows the law, Sundiata should be free. And the law is clearly on his side. We're not asking the court for any favors. We're just asking them to do what the law says. Um, in New Jersey, there's a presumption of release on parole unless the parole board can show that the petitioner is a risk to public safety. And clearly, Sundiata poses no risk to public safety. He's 85 years old, as I said, in poor health. He's a COVID survivor and has several other health complications, including early stages of dementia. Paul, I'll pause there. Um, I don't know if you want me to address anything in specific about the campaign, which certainly I can do, um, but let me let me hear from you. I'm curious. Um, so I know, I know you talked with Sundiata um, this week. Did Sundiata send a message to us? Um, did he, he have did. greetings for us? Can you share that with us? Yes, I told him that actually we were going to be doing this event on Sunday evening. He was very pleased. He sent his greetings to you, Paul. Um, for the audience who doesn't know, you have visited him and that certainly um, strengthened his spirits. And he also wanted all of his supporters to know how much he appreciates everything that people are doing to draw attention to his case and to help him gain his freedom He's been separated from his family for decades now, for more than four decades. Right. But he also wants everyone to know that he hopes that you will all fight for the freedom of all political prisoners, not just his. All right. And and how how do we have any idea where the when when the court will will issue a decision? Well, I, I only wish that I knew the answer to that, Paul. Um, the arguments before the New Jersey Supreme Court took place on January 27th. And all we can do is wait patiently or impatiently for them to render the decision. There's no time frame within which they have to render the decision. It's kind of like trying to read tea leaves to guess you know, when the decision will come. Um, obviously, we're all anxiously waiting, nobody more anxiously waiting than Sundiata. Um, mm -hmm. and his family. Um, okay. The main so, thing is for the court to rule in his favor when it rules. Okay, so Sophia, one of the things we talked about, and I'm gonna drop this on early, early, early on. One of the things we talked about was uh, the petition campaign yes. um, that's running. Can you share with us uh, that uh, some information about the petition campaign and yes. also, yeah. Can you share the, the website that people need to go to? We'll, we'll have that going. And so while folks are on this call, they should be going out and hitting that petition campaign if yeah. we can get it into uh, the chat. Uh, Natalie just, or but, someone behind, if you can uh, take the website that Sophia is going to announce. Yes, and I, I put it also in the chat. So oh, the you website, did? Okay, wonderful. It's already in the chat. Okay. Sundiata Akoli, just his whole name, Sundiata Akoli, FC for Freedom Campaign dot org. So Sundiata Akoli, FC dot org will take you to the website, the petition. We also have a postcard campaign to Governor Murphy. We have over 20,000 signatures on the petition. Our goal is to get to 25,000. So we need everybody to sign and tell everybody that they know. As we know, um, our community is very efficient with the grapevine and that's the social media that we need to activate quickly so that we can hit this goal of 25,000. Thank you so much. 
and Sophia, you're going to stay around um, yeah. because the, the the conversation I'd like to have tonight is a is a conversation between me, you, Charles, and Donna, and it's a back and forth conversation. It's a conversation because all of us and, and many of the people on this call, which is so great, we've, we've got so many folks on this call that are in the same conversation. So what I'm hoping is that I will generate some things. Um, and that you'll generate some things, that Charles will generate some things, and Donna will generate things that we can all uh, be an in inquiry about and ask uh, questions about. And of course, then we'll be taking some stuff from the chat as well. And so with that, uh, Sophia, I'm gonna move and introduce Donna, uh, bring Donna into the conversation and have her talk uh, some about what, what actually is a, a new work from her uh, it seems like she's constantly working on things. She's constantly writing and publishing, which is tremendous and, and great to be respected. So Donna, can I introduce you with this note? Uh, Donna Merch is an assistant professor of history at Rutgers University, where she is the chapter president of New, New Brunswick uh, chapter of Rutgers AAUP, AFT. She's also the co-chair of, of the union's BIPOC committee. Her publications include Asada Taught Me, State Violence, Racial Capitalism, and a number of other publications. I'm gonna to skip to uh, some of this. Um, she has written uh, for the Sunday Washington Post, The Guardian, The New Republic, the Nation, the Boston Review, and on and on and on. And we wish you to continue representing us in print, okay? <laughs> Look, the, the wonderful thing I think about, and Donna, do you have a book? Do you have your book covered? Can you share that with us, please? Yeah, yeah. That's such a striking and beautiful uh, cover. And it, the book came out when, Donna? Was it uh, just this? I think it's official drop date was March 29th. Wow, March 29th. Last week. So, last week. So if some of you guys have not seen um, Donna's, not only the cover of the book, but if you haven't seen the book, you'll probably see more of it now. And I really do encourage people to purchase. Uh, we'll, we will have a link in the chat to uh, so that people can go over and directly uh, purchase the book. And I'm not just hawking a book. I'm actually, uh, as I as I looked at your work, as I read your work, Donna, I felt that you were a perfect complement to a discussion that Charles Jones published in the Black Panther Party Reconsider. And I want to bring that in, and I want to start our discussion from that place, and I want to uh, begin it in a way that allows you to talk about Asada taught me, okay? So what I'm looking at, Donna, is Charles writes a book, Black Panther Party Reconsidered, and he's looking at the, a number of years ago, he's looking at the Black Panther Party and the immediate legacy. Asada taught me through your essays, you are looking at you're looking at the Black Panther Party too, but you're looking at, you have a different kind of lens that's working for you. You have a lens that is a number of years after Charles has taken his examination, you are re-examining and you're looking at what has been the impact of this legacy. In, in Charles' book, he's talking about the legacy of the Black Panther Party and that Black Power period you're looking at it in a different way because you now have the benefit of time. You have the, it's not the benefit. It, you have the experience. You have our experience of any number of black people being killed and murdered in the streets. And then you have, you do have the experience of a movement growing, a, a, a collected movement that has grown up in response to this. And you're addressing all of this in different ways, whether it is um, the, uh, the, whether it's the criminality of jailing people, 
whether it is the um, uh, the importation and the, um, the the spread of dope in our community, all of these things that uh, and that they come together now into social justice. You're addressing things like this, but you've got a powerful lens, and you're using Asada as a pivot point um, in this. And of course, Asada is free, and Sundiata is incarcerated. He is jailed. He is our jailed hero. And that would be the like of Asada if people had not stepped forward and taken her out of those clutches. So we've, we've got this dynamic, these dynamics, I would say. And I want to introduce you inside of that and let you talk to us a, a, a bit. And Donna, can I ask you to do this? And Charles Jones, who I will also introduce later, I want to ask you to do this. As we listen to Donna, Charles, if you have questions, please prepare them so that you can join this discussion. These are not going to be questions that just come from, from me and Donna. I say the same thing when Charles is talking. Your questions will enrich our discussion beyond me. And Charles, your questions will do the same. And so I really do appreciate um, if, if we have this as a conversation going backwards and forwards. So Donna, talk to so, us about Asada so and first, what you taught all of us. I would just like to start by saying how honored I am to be in this space. And I am by nature a listener. I think that listening is so important to historical practice and just to life and certainly to political organizing. And on this call, there are so many people that I have learned from, both personally by having talked to them or interviewed them, having met them in the pages of their memoirs and books, and finally, having benefited and known them from their activism and their actions. So I feel that I am on a call in many ways of elders and griots in our community. So I say these words um, really, from a humble spirit and in the spirit of dialogue. I think that I wrote an earlier book about 10 years ago called Living for the City. Um, and it was an argument that the Oakland party, because it was really about Oakland. And because I think each Panther chapter and branch as everyone on the call knows much better than I had its own character and its own history. Um, but it came from having lived in Oakland and just seeing the depth of Southern migration's influence on the party. And it was a history again, largely reconstructed through oral history and from listening. And you know, starting from a point of view of not assuming that I knew. And because that was possible, I found a history that was, I called familiar and unfamiliar. Um, and so in thinking about Asada taught me in some ways, it's a very personal title because it has a double meaning. It was, I'm born in the late 60s, coming of age in the late 70s and the 1980s. So I'm a real believer in, in thinking about both where you are born and when you are born. So I think of myself of that generation that came of age under Ronald Reagan at kind of the height of repression, the AIDS crisis, the war on drugs, the real, take off of mass incarceration that starts in the 70s. And it was when I read Asada, when it was first published in 1987, I was a freshman in college, and it just opened up this whole new world to me of black politics. I'd come from a very conservative part of the country and hadn't learned about the party. And so that moment, we all have these moments of consciousness, of coming to consciousness. And so in the book, it has this double meaning because it was Asada that taught me. The first thing that I ever learned about the party was Asada and all the other knowledge about Oakland came later. But the second meaning is a collective wisdom and a collective meaning, which is um, why members of the movement for black lives and black lives matter, why they so often use the phrase Asada taught me. So it was looking that in the movement and I was struck because these people are younger than I am. We're almost a generation apart by 20 years. And so it was opening that question about the continued 
deep resonance of the Panther Party with multiple generations. We're now third, three generations removed. And so that's where the title of the book came from. It is also written largely, these essays are mainly written between 2012 and 2016. And they were written with a, an animating spirit of joy of watching the takeoff of this movement led by young people that in many ways drew me in in the same way doing that research, uh, doing oral histories with uh, Oakland party members that I did the same thing. I went to Ferguson, my family is from St. Louis. I spent a lot of time listening and interviewing people and it was in some ways a history of the present. So even though the book deals with some very difficult issues, which is largely the core of the book is about different forms of state repression and incarceration. And one of my arguments is that Asada, I think has been taken up by this contemporary movement for several reasons. First, this movement is overwhelmingly led by women. And so I think that it's not an accident they chose a woman as their animating spirit. Two, you know, when you think about Asada's autobiography, compared to some of the other Panther autobiographies, largely this is a story of captivity and then with the frame of her own liberation. So I think another reason Asada resonates so deeply with people is that younger people is that this has largely been their experience. There is vastly more incarceration and her experience of both telling that telling the stories of coming to consciousness, becoming a Panther, then being incarcerated, giving birth to a child, and then ultimately becoming a fugitive, it speaks to the, the real extreme period of repression. And I would argue that our country has bec been becoming more and more repressive. That period in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and up through today, we're seeing ever larger numbers of people being incarcerated and also the stripping of rights, the scale of surveillance, the scale of criminalization, the scale of federal prosecutions, all the overlapping punishment campaigns. So Asada speaks to that powerfully, but because she was liberated and she is in Cuba and it is from Cuba that she has been broadcasting to us, I think that's a major reason why she's been taken up by the movement, the contemporary movement for black lives. All right, Paul, we cannot hear you. So I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Paul, unmute, please. And Nat, so, so as soon as I signed off, uh, would you would you would you make me co-host, please? As soon as I signed off, I couldn't get back in. As soon as I went on, on mute, I couldn't get back in. So if you make me co-host, that'll help. Okay. So so Donna, there are, there are a couple of things, and and and. Let me let me go here uh, first to ask you because this is really really striking. Um, the 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 Panther Party, as you correctly note, was largely I, I don't know I mean our heart and our soul came from the women in the Panther Party, right? And 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 as you note though in in your writing as you noted before, the machoism that has has gone as the overarching story of the Panther Party, not the story of the women who who gave substance and leadership to, to me. Okay. Here though, when when you're talking about Asada taught me, you're talking about something that, that just cannot be questioned. It's the leadership style of women that we're that we're talking about now. And it's distinct from the leadership style that we saw in the 70s. One of the interesting things that you note is that we're talking about, and this is not to quote you exactly, and I'm, I'm saying this so that you can help me clean it up. Um, what we're talking about is leadership styles that work in networks, of networks, as opposed to a centralized military command structure. We're talking about people who affiliate themselves people who actually ask permission to speak and people who uh, whose leadership is is really collective can you can you talk about that a little bit because one of the, is is this not only you know, look let me just stop there can you talk about that for a little bit the difference in styles and even outcomes 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I mean, there's a, a famous truism by Charles Payne, the civil rights historian um, who wrote the book that so many of us learn from about how to write a collective biography rooted deeply in local history and ancestry. And he has this famous line that he says, men led, but women organized. And what he meant by that, right? Some people are smiling on the call is that a lot of the work that's not the visible work, that's not the work of standing and being interviewed by the New York Times or standing on the podium. And that work is also important. We need people that mobilize, right? And many of the great charismatic figures of our movements, we could think of people from multiple movements, you know, be it Martin Luther King, or I would also say, as I talk about very critically in my first book, Living for the City, Eldridge Cleaver, who was tapped in many ways by especially kind of East Coast intelligentsia to speak for the party. So, but that deep work of organizing, of who's there, you know, one of the things the Oakland Panthers always say is, um, you always knew by who a Panther was when you asked them where they were on Wednesday night, because that was a night that the paper was being put <laughs> together and people would stay up all night long producing the paper. But you know, that, that work of organizing, I would say that when I think, and I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this because we have so much collective wisdom here. So these are preliminary thoughts, but I think compared to other organizations in the 1960s, the, the Panther Party had a lot of, there were important gains that were made around gender. There really were. We had, the, of course, the head of the party in the 1970s be a woman. We did have some men working in the school. So I think like, I think of it often like Cuba that, you know, Marxist revolutionary organizations, they often fall short in terms of gender, but it is also a kind of place of contestation over it. So I also do see it in those terms and interviewed men that did some of that quiet work of organizing. But, you know, according to Bobby Seale, the party was majority female by early 1969, that transition happens in 68. And the way in which, as the nature of the organizing shifted into survival programs, that you had larger and larger numbers of women joining the party and being visible. And I think there are multiple expressions of this, but I always say, you know, the Panthers started with a study group and its longest running institution was its school you know, and the important contributions of all of the women and the few men that worked in the school as well, you know, of course, of Erica Huggins and Elaine Brown and many other people who worked in the school that I interviewed. So I think that some of that history of organizing, and I say this again, you know, thinking about elders, I am always moved by the brilliance and the power of education in the party. And that's also that other meaning of Asada taught me. I learned this history from the party and that still remains true. Okay. I have uh, brother Charles Joan Donna, um, who the spotlight is on and I'm gonna use the spotlight to introduce him and bring, bring Charles into the discussion. Charles, first of all, um, I am so, so glad that you are with us. Um, and let me let me just do the introduction thing, Charles, and get that out of the way. Okay. Uh, Charles E. Jones is professor of Africana Studies at the University of Cincinnati. He is the editor of what I feel is one of the best books on the Black Panther Party, and that is the Black Panther Party Reconsidered, which was published by Black Classic Press. He is the editor of three books and numerous journal articles and books and chapters which focus on the Black Panther Party. His current project is with Tika Johnson uh, and it is entitled Forgotten Comrades, the Omaha II, Texas Tech University uh, Press and it will be published at some date soon. So the, the great thing that people should know about um, Charles is that Charles is like one of the earliest academics that was writing on the Black Panther Party. 
uh, he still is consulted by people who who do work on the Black Panther Party because he's got that type of credibility. He's got those long years in the field. And so having the two of you on this call is for me, what really makes this so special? First of all, you both are black, one is male and one is female, and you're getting to look at something that was an important part of my life 50 years ago and still is, was important, was an important part of many people on this call, their lives. And so we're sitting back, some of the things you say, we're gonna agree with some of the things, because oh no, it didn't really go that way. We're, we're gonna be off like that. But Charles, you've been doing this work for a long time. And and Charles, I should add that you are a Panther cub almost. Is that right? You'll get a chance to tell mm -hmm. us about tell us about that <laughs> also. So so Charles goes back away. Charles, I'm so glad to have you on board. Can you just share with us a little about your work? What got you into uh, studying the Panther Party? Why you felt it was important? Uh, can you share that with us on the call, please? Uh, yes. Well, thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be on this panel with uh, such distinguished panelists. And I appreciate the hard work of Natalie and the Black Classic Press. As you know, we go way back to publishing uh, Black Panther Party Reconsidered. Um, my connection with the Black Panther Party goes back to high school. And I'm still amazed that there were many Panther members who were in the party of my age and um, also some lost their life um, at my age. I know when I was 15 years old, I grew up military on uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. My father was retired Sergeant Major now. Um, and I know I had to be in the house when the street lights came on. So <laughs> breaking down um, um, guns, blindfolds on, like Jamal Joseph talks about, and working for the people and fighting the police, um, that was something afar from me. But I often saw the Panthers on news when taking American government class, we had to watch the news on a regular basis in 69, 70, 71. So they were often incidents about the Panthers and police raids and the like. So I've always had a fascination um, with the Black Panther Party. And um, when I attended graduate school and later on, so this is the mid seventies, early eighties, um, I'm, I'm sensing from the literature because there wasn't much scholarly literature on the Black Panther Party. The literature that focused on the Black Panther Party was um, very journalistic in nature, and as a result, it always focused on very sensationalistic kind of um, high profile cases. But the work of the Black Panther Party, the work that they did in terms of the survival programs and selling the papers and the commitment and the um, consciousness and the courageousness of, of young brothers and sisters, um, I felt was not captured. And that drove my work. Um, in fact, I wrote my master's thesis on the political repression of the Black Panther Party. I was fortunate to have a radical Marxist professor at all places, University of Idaho, not Moscow Soviet Union, but Moscow, um, Idaho. But I was permitted to do my work on the, the Black Panther Party looking at the repression. Um, when I went on for my doctorate, my committee wanted me to focus on more, more mainstream type work. So I wrote that on the Congressional Black Caucus, but I always had this desire to do work on the party. It was in 1991 when I invited Paul um, to Old Dominion University where I was um, in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Black Panther. And we started talking about this project. I was launching to do my book on the party that I still haven't done. And people like Donna and Robin Spencer and other folks have done, done great work. And Paul asked about the possibility of doing an anthology on the party. So it grew out of those discussions. And then by the 30th anniversary, um, we, were every, um, we were able to lay the groundwork for a book that was eventually published in 1998. Um, my work has often been called a reclamation project. It may have been um, a um, 
counter narrative to at the time, which was the defining book of the party, Hugh Pearson's work, Shadow of a Panther. And many scholars and non-scholars felt that this was the book on the Black Panther Party. This was supposed to be a scholarly work. He only interviewed three or four people, little archival work. And I just felt that the Panther research demanded more serious, rigorous scholarly research. So that's what laid the foundation for that work of the Black Panther Party reconsidered. Not that um, it was a just a um, positive book on the Black Panther Party, which is often accused by some scholars since we didn't get in the dirt and, and tear the party up. But I thought it was a, a balanced piece, identifying both the positive and the negative aspects of the Black Panther Party, and then introduce um, scholarship that was grounded in, in empirical and rigorous, rigorous work. Extensive interviews, um, a number of archival work, and et cetera. And then we brought new interpretations into the party in terms of a focus on the rank and file. Because at the time, most of the literature on the Black Panther Party up to 98 focused on um, the key leaders and the key leaders out of Oakland, with the exception you get work on, 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 on Fred Hampton. Um, we had excellent work on, on gender by um, Angela LeBlanc, who was a young student who wrote her honors thesis at Harvard as an undergraduate on gender in the Black Panther Party. I understand that um, she has just completed a book with Stephen Shames called Comrade Sisters, which is a photography, a photographic history of the women in the Black Panther Party. And she's doing some other great work um, as well. Um, so what, what we wanted to do was to introduce new information to the Black Panther Party, um, provide a model for how Black Panther research should be conducted, because we have scholars who speak on the Black Panther Party, make assessments on the Black Panther Party, never have interviewed anyone, never have done any hard, rigorous um, research on, on the Black Panther Party. And that's what I'm most proud of. We also talked about, again, where it's been accused of being an overly friendly book to the Black Panther Party. One person has, has written, how can you write a history of the Black, how can you reconsider the Black Panther history when the history has not been written, you know? But at the same time, we, we didn't claim that that was a historical book. That was a book to generate the kind of conversation that has subsequently occurred on, on the Black Panther Party. In one chapter, we look at, we move the discussion solely away from governmental repression. And we know that um, repression is probably, if you were doing a regression analysis, my quantitative background, that would be clearly the most significant impact that explains the demise of the Black Panther Party. You no, know, there's mm -hmm. no question about that. It's hard to even untangle how the repression has impacted the Black Panther Party in many ways. Well, we would be remiss to, to leave the legacy and the history of the Black Panther Party to reduce that to solely repression, right? Because mm -hmm. there are some mistakes that, that we don't want to du duplicate or emulate as we move towards our, towards our liberation. And we thought, we were doing that in the Black Panther Party by focusing not on not only on external factors, but also on many internal factors uh, as well. It's a book that I'm very proud of that um, was published in 1998. Um, I always like to say with primarily Black scholars, um, a number of, of party members from the rank and file, Steve McCutcheon, who worked um, at the school that Donna talked about, and led the kids to win black belts on, in karate. Um, to, to the late Jimmy Slater out of, out, out of the Cleveland chapter, um, sisters like, like Regina Jennings. So um, we're very proud that that book has stood the test of time since 1998. <clears throat> Charles, thank you, thank you. Um, so look, I, I'm, we're, we're, we're talking about um, and I would hope that we can get this. We're, we're, we're examining a piece of our history that many people on this call have lived through um, and have been touched by. What we get to see is Black Panther Party and that whole Black liberation movement giving birth to where we are today, the struggles that we encounter today. 
Charles, when you think back, and, and I'm going to ask Donna uh, similarly, and on in a similar way, when you think back on the Panther Party, and you you sum this up uh, when when you talk about the legacy in the book, I'm just curious. What are you seeing now about the legacy that carries forward to where we are today? Uh, when you looked at it in 1998, you saw some things. Are you still seeing those things? Are you seeing different things now? I'm just curious. Well, one thing that I think is very striking from the recent racial reckoning and the loss of Je um, George Floyd and Sister Taylor from Louisville is how America responded. It has been a multiracial response, clearly led by Black people, but it's still been a multiracial response mm -hmm. um, to the degradation and the oppression of Black people, to the murder of Black people. And I think, and I mentioned that as producing as, as, one, as, as an aspect of the party's very rich legacy. Because in, prior to 1998, the party was much projected as very much as a basically a political an unruly political gang full of misogynistic black men carrying guns that um, if they didn't um, get in police shootout, they had no substance. So the hard work that the Panthers were doing, the legacy that the Panthers left in terms of its commitment to the commitment to all people, the self-determination of all people. And I think that has great lessons and resonance for the United States today, as we move into a country of minorities, right? We saw a great deal of, of white folks and brown people and Latin American people and yellow people come, come, come together to fight and to confront the racial reckoning after the loss of George Floyd. I think there's much history in the Black Panther Party in terms of all power to all people. And, as, and that does not necessarily mean that um, they didn't have the, the, the interests and the history of Black people in mind, but they also have a commitment to eliminating oppression of all people. And I think there's many lessons that we can learn from the Panthers in terms of electoral politics and social mobilization through that commitment to um, rainbow politics. Um, we saw the Panthers ahead that's often overlooked in terms of respecting the rights of, 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 of homosexuals, right? Of, of gay people where the Panthers were way out front when, when Huey talks about this in 1970 and 10, 15 years later, Ben Chavis was almost driven out of the um, office of the NWACP when he participated in the, that, the major gay march in, 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 in um, Washington, DC. I think there's lessons in the Black Panther Party in terms that you can challenge City Hall and that you can work for you and you can work on behalf of your own community in terms of the community service programs. Where the Black Panther Party had across the country 13 different chapters that ran free medical health clinics. If that's almost a form of reverse um, uh, conservatism, if you if you will, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. And in my work, I I I identify that as like, like the crown jewel of, of, of the Black Panther Party social activist, what it takes to run a, 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 a free health clinic, right? To the free ambulance um, um, clinic in, in, in Winston-Salem. So there's a lot of lessons of how we can affect local government through the type of activism that, that the Panthers engage in and not necessarily by just picking up the gun but at the time, we understood the importance of that because what was confronting Black people. But the Black Panther Party was certainly more than just picking up the gun. But that is an aspect of the organization that cannot be lost or minimized as, as, as the party almost searches for mainstream legitimacy by folks. That, that revolutionary um, fervor and commitment of the Black Panther Party uh, must be May, must um, be maintained as an important yeah. aspect of that organization. Should I pick it up here? Oh, yeah, I'm finished. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree with everything uh, that Brother Charles just said. You know, the interesting thing when you ask a question of legacy, it's a complex question because you have the the, all of the things that the party did, 
But then when you talk about subsequent generations, that's often understood in different ways. And one of the things that I think about, as I talked about that, those almost three generations, the Panthers, the people that are born around the period that the Panthers are formed, that I'm a part of, and then millennials, many of whom are born in the mid 1990s. And what I'm struck by is how, how different people have chosen different parts of the Panther history. And, but then of course, there's the richness of the history itself that we've just spoken to. Um, I'd say for me, one of the big things I think about in terms of black radicals and more generally, you know, the politics of revolutionaries, radicals and the left is pre and post 1989. So I'm born in the late sixties, but many of my teachers were people that had been involved in revolutionary struggles. So the, you know, Maurice Bishop and the new Jewel movement and working with Decima Williams, people that I knew that had been you know, involved and close to the original manly government in Jamaica. So in many ways, in my early years, I was schooled by black revolutionaries who were really still part of the vision of saw state socialism, Marxism, and some Maoism as being very important. So it was a revolutionary tradition that was often rooted in both mobilizing against state violence, but seeing the appropriation and control of the state as important. And I think that to me is so important in the Panther Party, but it's also, it grew out of a different movement, a different moment. And so I would say for people that are my age, what really stood out to me is when I was a young person in the party is that, you know, when I'm coming of age in the 1990s, I'm sorry, 1980s, in many ways, it was a period where there was the appropriation of the civil rights movement by conservatives. So, you know, the transformation of the I have a dream speech as the justification for colorblind ideology. And so I think many people of my generation, there was a anger that we felt we were looking for a form of politics that wasn't simply what we saw. I was also young, I see this a little differently now, but just the appropriation of the civil rights movement into a very narrow frame. And so Asada represented that revolutionary history, also that she was connected to Cuba and the meaning of Cuba and Cuba's survival, it's you know, creation of 99% literacy that's training doctors who go all over the world. So as part of, again, that kind of revolutionary period that was still, I think, is the direct lineage of the anti-colonial movements in the 1960s. It was also the Panthers expression of black power in the 1980s, the aesthetics, what it meant to have an all black organization that, that publicly embraced and used the practice of armed self-defense. So in the 1980s, to me, the Panthers had this really, they were providing us an alternate vision and an explicit anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist vision. So I think that that was absolutely crucial. Um, you know, in Asada, my chapter that's on the movement for black lives, I put that together really through interviewing people and also spending a lot of time in movement spaces. And it was striking to me, the things that are sources of continuity from the Panther period and the things that have changed. And I think one of the biggest things that's changed is post 1989, 1991, many of our black revolutionary organizations, they were using Leninist models with central committees and top down hierarchical party organization. And there's been such a pushback against that, I think from really a millennial generation, whether it's in the case of Occupy Wall Street or even the movement for black lives, these are lateral movements that have really repudiated what they see as hierarchical organizing. And so I, perhaps because I'm, even though I'm at the tail end of these kinds of leftists that came out of the Cold War, those were still like my teachers and mentors. And I still, despite the problems of hierarchy and, you know, in Living for the City, I talk about how the lack of democracy and the domination of the leadership, that it did some real damage to the rank and file. Because like Charles, I saw the rank and file as really the most important part of the party. These are the people who made change. These are the people looking at it as a collective biography and collective struggle. So there were problems with top-down democratic centralist organization, but nevertheless, these the Panthers and other organizations like it, they got so much work done. They, they printed their own newspaper. 
And that newspaper is still an archive that's constantly being used by activists today and scholars. And I'm not seeing that same kind of organization. I think I would like us to go back and revisit some of, you know, some of the Panthers forms of organizing. I really find it important. And it's another reason that it's constantly renewing. Um, another important thing I would say that resonated both with people of my generation coming of age in the 80s and 90s, our, our generation is very conservative. You can even see it in electoral politics, right? Like so much, so many of our radical politicians, right. they are 10, 15 years younger, or you have the older generation, but the 80s and 90s, the framework that many Panthers gave me for this was really almost a counter cultural revolution that there was a real attack and attempt to dismantle a lot of the, the radical culture of the 60s and 70s. But that said, I think, you know, the important work of the newspaper of Emory Douglas of creating this, a, a particular kind of revolutionary aesthetic that was meaningful to people. And one of the things you see taking up for different groups in the movement for black lives is they are taking up some of the iconography and culture and, you know, the, the images of Asada become very important. So I always think of Emory Douglas's quote of saying that revolutionary art must always assume the forms, the popular forms that people are familiar with. And to me, that was like core also to the party's vision of political education, recognizing where people are, drawing your forms of organizing from the things that the people want. And I was talking to my friend Chandrai Kumanika last night and we were talking about that black organizing tradition in which culture is very important, not in, of course, we had the Panthers denunciations of cultural nationalism, especially in Oakland, I think very different in other parts of the country, but culture in the sense of really thinking about what it is that people want and need, and then speaking to that and organizing it the way that Huey Newton talks about how he organized the uh, police patrols. And then finally, and this is really a subject for dialogue and I'm interested to hear from other people, especially during the pandemic and right now, so many people I know in Philadelphia are involved in mutual aid because people are really hurting. People do not have enough to eat and they're looking back to the party and its tradition of community and survival programs. But one thing I think is different, so they're influenced by it and they're inspired by it. But one of the things that I truly admire about the party and I would like to see it amplified even more is not just mutual aid for mutual aid's sake, which is crucial, but combining it with political education and a larger set of goals, which shamed the state. So this is not just individual, we can replace what the state should be doing. It's, we are shaming the state, we are providing people's needs, but we're integrating that into a larger political goal. And I think I would like to see more discussion about that aspect of the Panthers legacy. So Donna and Charles, I wanna break in here really quick. First of all, Paul's had a computer problem. And so I am here. I'm, I'm, I'm back in. Oh, he's back in, yay. But I do wanna mention that, cause I was gonna to have to step into some big shoes right there and I really wasn't ready. Um, but I do wanna mention this, he's not on camera, but Emory Douglas, you mentioned him. Emory is on the call today. And so I, I, I do want to make sure I acknowledge him. Emory, if you're able to come on camera, you should come on because I think that people deserve to see if they haven't seen the person who Donna is at least, you know, referring to when she's talking about that. And so Emory will, oh, Emory's on. Okay, so let me see if I can bring Emory on. I'm just going to add a spotlight. There's Emory. So Emory, I'm going to also ask you to unmute and just, <laughs> so there's an unmute button. If you would unmute Emory, at least just say a couple words. So... <laughs> So she was talking about you creating a look and the legacy and the visuals. Yes, that was, that, that was a reflection of our politics and our involvement with the uh, community and setting up the social programs. It was a reflection of those things. It, it was like a, not a, uh, a we are, uh, it was a we are, but not a me are kind of uh, concept as you look back on it. So it was in that context that, in, the, in that spirit, and it came out of uh, our, our development and as we evolved and we grew, uh, all that was a reflection of, of the artwork, the symbolism. Right, okay. But, but can I say, 
no. Yes, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I, I, I couldn't what, let what that I moment want, pass. The question that came out in regards to the, uh, and the women in the party and being in the leadership, that was a fact. But when you started early on, that started earlier. That started in 1967 when we had our, our first small chapter headquarters. Uh, there were some sisters who, right from the hood, who first came in, named Jackie Horton and some others. And they used to bring up the issue all the time uh, in relationship to why weren't women in the leadership when they were sacrificed just like men were and what have you. And it was not in a, not with an attitude, but an attitude in, 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 in regards to not seeing it men, women in, in the leadership. And I think we also, uh, in Sacramento, that always comes up and I have to clear that up. There were men and women a part of that delegation. There was the, uh, the um, R.U.C.L. Seal, Bobby Seal's wife was there. Uh, the, uh, the brothers from murder, from Denzel Dow, some of his sisters were there from Richmond or part of that delegation as well. So I, I, so I, I try to explain those things uh, from the context of my limited viewpoint, which is a part of the whole that everybody was a contributor to as well. Comrade Brother Emery, thank you. <laughs> So, so, so one of the things, and, and I'm, look, I've been trying to figure out how to do this, um, and, and I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to stick it out there um, real quick. We, we'll talk about it later at the end of the program, but for some of you who do not know it, uh, this is a, I'm, I'm going to digress for one minute, please forgive me, uh, because I've been carrying this and it's like, I'm in, I'm in the family. And it's on my gosh, I think Paul's video has frozen again. Paul, I'm gonna have to give you a pay raise so you can get better internet. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Paul is frozen up again. So let me do this then. We have a couple of questions on the, and I got people, you know, let me do this. We are about an hour in, and normally we will acknowledge people here, and this is, it could be a little out of place, but I want to acknowledge some folks who are on the call. Paul will probably work through his issues. Um, yeah, it may, it may help Don if we turn off his video. He may have to do that. Um, okay, so let me do an acknowledgement really quickly. We'll just do a quick break here while Charles and Don are still on screen, and we do have questions that are in the chat. I want to do those with Paul on the call, though, so that he can also respond you know, to those questions if need be. So I do want to acknowledge some folks. Mm -hmm. I do want... No, don't worry about it. Oh, Paul, okay, so. Yeah, so so it pays to have two computers in the house, all right? <laughs> you, you, got, you guys keep this, keep this in mind. Have two computers. I'm going to continue, okay? Now, if that other computer comes up, can you just shut, shut that one down for me, please? All if right. the other computer comes up, it comes up. So look, the thing I really want to get out, and I'm sorry, I apologize for the... Um, the technical problem we just had. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask folks to stay on the call because at the end of the call, we're going to talk about Aidy Conway, who is experiencing some difficulties right now with some challenges with his health. He's in good shape. We expect him to pull through it and all like that, but we'll talk about that at the end of the call. I really need to get that up off my heart because you guys know of my relationship with Eddie. Um, and it's, it's difficult having this conversation with family and not sharing, um, um, not sharing about this brother. So we're gonna do it at, at the end of the call. And I just ask people to stay on as long as you can, please. And I just would like people to leave with correct information. Um, he is, um, even though it may seem somber, he's, he's in good shape and he's, he's coming along. We just got a road ahead of us, okay? So I know that's a digression, and Nat, thank you for, for being there uh, and picking up. I wanna, if, if I can leave that in, in the middle for a moment, I wanna get back and bring Sophia back into the conversation. Because I'm curious um, how Sundiata is seeing this from the inside. How's he seeing the legacy? How's he seeing uh, his role even? Because, you know, he was with Asa uh, for so long. He was in the struggle for so long. You know, this, this brother 
was doing time, <laughs> you know, got out and back in. How is he, and I know you can't speak exactly for him, but if you know, can you share as best you can what Sundiata is thinking about this period and what we're experiencing, particularly in terms of Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, and all of the legacy? Well, you know, the, one of the beautiful things about Sundiata is that he's brilliant and he stays on top of what's going on in the world, not only internationally, but locally. And so he watches closely as organizations like BLM, Movement for Black Lives and other formations are building many, many, many leaders in these various groups write to him for advice, send his, their writings, ask for um, edits and critiques and want to discuss with him their movements and, and leadership styles. So he stays very much um, in the mix. And at the same time, he'll say, I'm 85 years old. The young people of today have to shape their movements based on the current circumstances. That the, the lessons from when he was a, a leader and active member of the BPP, those were the lessons and, and the strategies crafted for the circumstances at the time. And his hope is that the young people today will take from that what's applicable and build on it um, and, and do better. Because ultimately, just like in the 60s and 70s, the young people today are hopefully motivated by undying love for the people and that they will use all of the tools available to them to continue to push for the liberation of our people. Sophia, thank you uh, so much. And, um, you, you know, I was listening to you. I was thinking about how you drive up <laughs> to see that brother with frequency, how you remain our link to someone who has given so much in our, you know, and still gives in our struggle. I was thinking about how you do that. And I just want to celebrate you. I mean, I just want to acknowledge you acknowledge you for those long drives up into that lonely Pennsylvania, up into those lonely Pennsylvania hills, because that is a long drive. The time that you spend doing it, the time that you spend taking care of this brother and that you've taken care of other political prisoners, you know, long before this, you just need to be recognized, acknowledged and celebrated sister for the gift that you are to us and the gift that you are to all of us. So please, you know, you know, like, I know you guys are on mute and what have you, but take a second and just acknowledge the greatness that we have here. Um, Sophia is of course the active participant Charles and Donna get to watch the stuff, not to say you guys aren't active participants, but you get to watch and analyze this and, and, and get to see it all. And with it, we've got a combination going here of life and legacy. And that's why my questions were about legacy earlier. I'm curious, uh, so we, we've got a lot of Panthers on the call. Charles and, and uh, Donna, you guys have worked with Panthers and talking with Panthers. We got to listen to Emory Douglas, you know, put, 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 put some stuff in there directly in this call. I'm curious for Panthers who are on the call, what is it that we should be doing to, what is it not, not that we should be doing, what is there for us to do to further assist you in your work, Donna? to further assist you in your work, Charles, and the budding scholars that are coming along. What is there for us to do? You know, like we're, we're looking at the end of the road and some people may not understand that, but I do, you know, <laughs> but we still got more things to do while we're here. What do you guys want us to do? Okay, Paul, so how do you want us to handle that one? So there's um, some- Donna, Donna can speak, uh, you know, uh, is, is that good now? 
Yeah, I thought there was. I thought you addressed a question to other folks who were in the room. Oh no, no, no. I'm I'm sorry. I'm addressing it to Donna and to Charles. If it wasn't that clear, I'm sorry. Okay, that's cool. I'm asking and their then, their thoughts. And then we do have a couple questions from the chat that we want okay, to be great. able to squeeze in. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I keep putting myself on mute and then being able not to get off of mute. Um, so the question is to think about how to keep open these channels about kind of transmission of the party's history or dialogues. Would that be, is that accurate, Paul? Um, what, what I'm asking is what do you see that, that Panthers can do to further document the history to further uh, uh, to assist in the work of documentation and narrative that needs to be done. Um, what have you encountered that, that you would like from us? Well, to be honest, as I said in the beginning, I'm just honored to, to be in this company because people have been so generous with me over time. I think that the largest thing that's needed are, and this is really in some ways our responsibility to do some of this like heavy lifting of work of creating platforms for intergenerational dialogue. But I think that just the brilliance of the party, so much of it is needed today. I find myself, it's like going back always to the well of a particularly rich knowledge and black radical tradition. And that's what drew me to the party. And 30 years later, it still draws me to the party. I think that the brilliance of the Panthers and the depth also of trying to take, how do I put this? Uh, the history of people of African descent in this country and to put it into dialogue with worldwide revolution and anti-imperialism. I think that one of the single biggest things that miss, is missing, because I've been teaching at a public university in New Jersey for a long time. I feel like I'm getting old. I'm, I'm getting old enough that the students are always a surprise to me. Like the things that they say and what their points of reference is now radically different from mine. That's how I know I'm old. But I feel like one of the things that's most needed is anti-imperialism was so much at the heart of the party. And I feel like we are in a moment in which hegemonic American power and militarism is unchallenged in a way that I have not seen in my entire lifetime. And I say that as someone who was 12 years old when Ronald Reagan was elected, but there's a way in which that I think, you know, the destruction of five Middle Eastern countries, the, in many ways, the election of Barack Obama, there was the expectation of a decrease in American militarism. And I think one of the greatest areas right now that needs the most attention is thinking about this, you know, the party in many ways was created both out of the histories of people that migrated out of the South and coming into cities and criminalization and the violence of the state, but always linking that violence to the international violence, the anti-communist wars, and looking to Ho Chi Minh, looking to Cuba, looking to revolutionary struggles. And I think that we need that intergenerational dialogue. You know, it's important not to be nostalgic, but I do feel so thankful and grateful to have had a chance to spend time learning this history because I wasn't taught it. I wasn't even taught it in graduate school. You know, I learned it by sitting there and going through the Panther archives, by reading people's autobiographies, by going through the paper article by article. I was truly educated by that. And so I feel like we need as much connection and, and real dialogue. You know, we need the brilliance of the Panthers. And I think the movement for black lives needs it as well. There is a great deal of inspiration about Asada, but because the organizing environment today is so different than the 1960s, the core of left organizing is through not-for-profits that are driven by philanthropy. 
And this has had in some ways, I think a devastating effect on independent organizing. So that would be the second thing that I was talking about party-based organization and the way that the Panthers built their own capacity. I think that that is desperately needed. We need organizations that are not being funded by philanthropy. So those are two things. There's so many different things about the party that are needed, but I would love to be able for those of us to you know, figure out platforms, venues, discussions, but to have intergenerational dialogue to think about that because it's very different to invoke someone or a period or an era or an organization as an icon than it is to actually sit in dialogue with them and to figure out how do we take this wisdom and apply it to the conditions of today. And Charles, the same question to you. Um, and just to clarify again, what is there for us to help you? Well, I, I think it's very important. I don't know if it's necessarily to help me. In some ways, I think it's incumbent upon the party members to help scholars to get the story right. I mean, because we can only do so much reading and interpreting newspaper articles and the like, but you and um, Emory and many other comrades that's, that's on the um, chat today, you were there. So I think that input is important. I think leaving your story for history is important and um, scholars can help to do that. I know the work of Wayne Farr, um, a rank and file member out of the Los Angeles chapter. Um, he worked with a scholar by the name of Karen Stanford who published the book, The Nine Lives. Um, to leave that story to not only your family, but the scholars so, so it becomes a part of the larger community. I hope to, to do in the future is to like leave my recordings and research for local chapters and local libraries. If there's not an HBCU in town, Maybe we can leave it to a library that's dedicated to the black community, like the Auburn Research Library in um, Atlanta or the Blair Library in, in um, Denver. So uh, leaving that story um, for the future generations, firsthand accounts, I think is um, very important. I'm interested, since we have a, a number of party members online is, and I know the party, help to distinguish itself because it did place it at the place the party in the belly of the beast if you if you will a part of that anti-colonial anti-imperialist struggle that Donna has spoke to but in some of my work I'm, I'm trying to tease out is um was that always the most effective strategy it seems to me at times it took attention away from from issues on the local level. And that's what I'm trying to work through mm. and see what the party members felt about that. Mm. When you're studying, then you get, hey, now we're in Jushi, um, the, the, the Korean leader's ideology, and now that's applicable to party chapters. How relevant was that for party members in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, when they're dealing on the local level or in Houston or when who comes out of jail and wants to trade our soldiers for, um, um, you know, the, the the trade with the Vietnamese, and, and they didn't accept that, you know, mm -hmm. or, or 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 the ideology of intercommunalism, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure that out in 1970 to end all classes and get rid of the industrialists. Where was that hardcore connection with with the local level? So I'm, I'm interested to see. It, were there better ways that we could get more of a balance between the party being a part of that anti-imperialistic struggle and what's taking place on the local level in, in, in terms of mobilizing people um, to get some resonance in their lives? Charles, I'm, I'm going to, um, if, if I can, I'm, I'm going to speak to that. Um, I can't speak for the party. I can speak for, you know, my, my take on it. Um, Natalie, if we can if we can do two things or three things, uh, I know we have questions. Um, so we want to deal with the questions. Um, where do you want to acknowledge folks, Nat? Where where do we want to do that? We, I guess we can do that after the questions. Can we do that? To acknowledge. Well, 
Yeah. Well, what, well, I can do an acknowledgement now. I do want to do okay. that. So, and just so that everybody knows, after acknowledgements, we're going to start dealing with some of the questions. So if there's something that's burned, we have a couple of questions, but if there's something that's just burning while I'm doing some acknowledgements, now's the time to get those in there. Some of those questions occurred way up in the chat. I think we've got them. So please just put your questions there while I'm doing some acknowledgements. I want to do these and I don't, um, and, and, I, and I tell you, I hope I haven't missed anyone, but I do want to acknowledge, um, first of all, we are, are so regularly, we have Reverend Jeremiah Wright on our calls. It's always a pleasure and an honor to have him with us. And, um, and he's on today. I don't know if he's still with us, but I know that he was on with us earlier today. I always love to do that. I want to uh, acknowledge Alonzo Sam and Kichi Taifa, who was on our last call when we were working on the petition to have Marcus Garvey exonerated and Kichi was involved in that. And I wanna thank her for that and acknowledge her. Many people are asking about books and where can I get them? And I'm gonna to get to some other things in a minute, but Sharik, Sharikiana Garima is on this call. She is the owner of Sankofa Books. And so you all need to go to the website as we are talking about books. That's where you need to get these is you need to be talking to, you need to get on their, their website and order the books that we're all talking about. And if you don't see them there, then you just need to give them a call. Sharika Yana, if you're still there, put your information in the chat so folks can contact you, okay? So I wanna acknowledge her because as of now, I think she's the only bookseller, black bookseller that's on our call. And I do wanna acknowledge her for that. Thank you so much. Um, let me go down here. So we've, we've, we've mentioned Emery. Thank you, Emery, for coming on. I also want to, uh, acknowledge Karen Stanford, who is one of BCP's authors. She co-authored a book with Charles Jones. I want to acknowledge Pat Reed Merritt, who was also on, on one of our most recent uh, Zoom calls. Uh, April Motley was on a call, and April worked for BCP a while ago, probably while this book was being done. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge April for being there. Gail Hansberry is also on our call. She is also, um, uh, we have republished recently one of the books that her dad worked on. Todd Burroughs, BCP author, Laini Mataka, poet extraordinaire. We're working on some new work from her right now. Thank you so much, Laini, for being here. Greg Carr was on earlier, and I think Paul may want to circle back to Greg in a little bit. Zama Cook. Zama often works on some of our book covers, so I want to acknowledge Zama Cook. I want to acknowledge Susie Day, who was on. Susie worked with Paul and Eddie Conway on the book, The Brother You Choose. And Susie was on, I don't know if she is still on or not, but she was here earlier. So I was trying to catch um, most of the folks that I could. Janet Sims Woods was on before we did a call. We talked about Dorothy Porter Wesley and she was also on today. And so I just wanted to make sure I did that. Paul, if there's anybody in that list who you wanna have say anything, it's totally up to you before we go to questions that I'm seeing in the chat, so, you can do that. Uh, one is, uh, I also wanna, I did see Laura Whitehorn. <clears throat> on um, Laura and Susie are partners, but they also are very, very active and have always supported uh, the prison work, the work that's going on now. I think they're directing their energy to uh, seniors mostly now. Um, if Greg Carr is on, would, would Greg, um, uh, can, can we put Greg in the queue so, so he can be right behind this quick thing I'm gonna say with Charles um, or to Charles? Charles, I'm sure your, your question is out there. And if other Panthers want to reach Charles, uh, we can put his information in the chat so that you can respond to Charles. But Charles, I, I don't know. I think the international work was absolutely essential for my consciousness as a young Panther. Um, it connected me with the world. It gave me a way of understanding the developments that were in the world. And it gave me a way of understanding that we were not just talking about things that were happening in Baltimore or Philadelphia for that matter. It gave me an opportunity to see that we were talking about a monster that literally dominated the world and could be separated uh, in that way. So I, I can't even imagine that the Panther Party would have had the impact that it had if it did not display itself uh, in an international way. In that sense, let me add that I don't think that the party is that much different when we think about it than the Garvey movement, 
which was also international in space. You know, you, you know, forget the fact that it was pan-African based, it was internationally based in that uh, Garvey had ambassadors that literally interacted with events all over the world in a much more thorough way than what the Black Panther Party ever did. You know, we had an embassy and we had efforts that we, you know, jauntas that we would take. But I think the true test, and this happens with, uh, Donna, you may be able to say something on this with Black Lives Matter as well. I think the true test of our representative organizations are that they see us as being citizens of the world. And I think that it was essential in the Panthers case, Charles. Now, someone else may give you a different take on it, but that would be my quick, quick take on it. Well, what I would be curious to know, Paul, and, and that outlook was certainly important, and there was some tangible, pragmatic benefits that the Panthers certainly um, garnered from having that international focus, um, certainly. But in your organizing in Baltimore, I would be very curious I'm curious to know how did that international focus translate into everyday organizing yeah. and recruiting in Baltimore? And, and Charles, I, I will gladly take that offline and let's have a okay. definitely have a discussion on it. Cause you know me, you know, I'd be rattling on and on and all on. All right, all right. You know, I'm, just, I'm just curious about, about that. Yeah. So I'm just curious. And Donna? Yeah, just a quick response. You know, it was interesting. When I first moved to Oakland, I moved in Oakland in 94. And it was living in Oakland that uh, ultimately made me write about the party because its history was everywhere. It really was an amazing experience to live there for 10 years and just be surrounded by the history. And because I came from a very conservative part of the country from Western Pennsylvania that had chain migration from Mississippi, the nature of the community I grew up in was very different than the community in Oakland. And one of the questions I had when I first started learning about the party, uh, and it fits in with that longer tradition of black radicalism, is why did people choose to articulate their lived experience through an international frame? So that the presence of internal colonialism in the Bay Area, that was so generative to the ideology including not only of the Panthers, but some of the other student organizations like Revolutionary Action Movement. And I just, because it's not necessarily intuitive, you know, often when I think of politics, you think of the things that are most immediate and material to you. And I truly believe in the power and importance of local organizing. So it wasn't in initially immediately intuitive to me about why people, even in to interpret their own experience, why they wanted to internationalize it. And I think that's where the historical moment matters. The accumulation of all of these anti-colonial victories. You know, the notion of Black Americans in some ways feeling left behind as they're watching, you know, the transformation of the African continent and the victory in Cuba. So I think in some ways it came out of this historical moment. So that piece I think is interesting, although I take Charles's point, this enormous diversity of the party. And it's not, I think, this idea of the party as a Congress of local movements, I think is true. Right now I'm doing a lot of reading about the New York party, about Lincoln detox, because I'm writing a book on crack and I'm interested in the Panthers radical anti-drug movement and just going back to that history with a very different frame. And I'm seeing in so many ways how the New York party was so different from Oakland, although there were things that tied it together. So I, I take that seriously too, that, that the way that ideology of internationalism and then intercommunalism, the way that it was understood and the importance it was given varied in different chapters and branches. Nat, do you wanna deal with, um, and, and Emery, was, Emery, did you have something to say on that? I'm sorry. And if Emory is still there, if Emory comes in to say something other than that, Nat, if you want to. Yes. Um, okay, go ahead, Emory. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I, the international aspect was always there from my paper. And the mm -hmm. centerfold of our paper was always uh, international news. And that was required reading. And sometimes just chapters and branches had political education classes around those issues. And we were invited to Cuba in 1967, in early 1967. 
And I, I was supposed to go, but because we had nobody to work on the paper, hmm. Bobby lobbied against my going. Mm -hmm. And so George Murray, the first minister of education, went to Cuba in 1967. And so we always and and we were we always had just solidarity with these international struggles that were going on around the world. Yeah. So that's why you see in 1969 when uh, um, when uh, the movie was a uh, Vanguard of the Revolution was done. You seen us in the Casbah, and and and, after, and 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 meeting with all the different liberation movements. Cause we used to meet with the different liberation movements all the time. When we used to read the books, we used to, and read the papers and see what was going on and showing our solidarity based on those, all those issues. Yeah. So uh, it was out, that spirit of solidarity was always inclusive of the Black Panther Party itself, in some way, shape, fashion, form. Thank you, Emory. Oh, um, do you have a moment for me to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I, mean, I definitely, I definitely want to recognize you, Sophia. So, I, I am fascinated about this discussion about um, the international connection. One of the things that we learned early um, on with the party and the existence of political prisoners in this country was that the United States definitely did not want the rest of the world to know that there were political prisoners in this country. It cost Andrew Young his job, and because the party was effective in making it known to the rest of the world, the struggles that black people were having in this country and the power, the militarization of the state against the Black Panther Party, the rest of the world took note. So when our soldiers started um, being captured and were political prisoners, there was a listening audience in the international community about their plight. Um, there's many examples, Mumia just being one, of political prisoners in this country who were recognized and continue to be recognized around the globe. So we can't begin to measure how important it is to keep the plight of what's happening in this country in the international arena as well, and to bring that international arena into our local communities and organizing too. Charles, I'm gonna look to follow up with you because I'll be interested in, in what you've uncovered and what you're seeing. And you know just where your research has taken you on this point, okay? okay. Um, Nat, do you want to work with some of the questions? Because I'm sure this will be questions for Charles and Sophia and Donna. Um, yeah. So I do have one, just so that you know, Greg is probably there, but not there. He's logged on, but he's not <laughs> able to come on. So, all and, right. And 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 while you're doing that, uh, Nikichi, thank you so much for being on all the calls, and thank you for all of the work, Nikichi. Taifa is our other great warrior sister uh, who, who has worked with political prisoners. Nikichi and I go back to when she was undergraduate on Howard's campus and she was in the struggle then, <laughs> in the struggle then and she has continued in the struggle. So thank you sister for being on the call. I just wanted to acknowledge you, okay? Thank you. Nat? Okay. And Nat, when, 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 when you, if you get a break, I need you to do something special for me. And that is to pull up that letter on Eddie, uh, because if we finish up the questions, we'll go to it. And I don't have access to that computer right now. Okay. So All right. just keep that in the back of your mind as we're doing this. Okay. So here's a question. This one was from much earlier on. Um, so this is from Errol, Errol A. Henderson. And he says this, he says, Asada said that the basic problem of the BPP was it had no systemic approach to political education. Would Sister Murch and Brother Jones speak to the prevalence of this problem in present Black liberation struggles in the US that have not updated their theory and strategy of social change to fit present, present circumstances? Thanks. Charles, do you oh. want to go first? <laughs> um. From what I understand, uh, Brother Earl, that's that's an aspect of Panther activism that has not necessarily followed through with at least the, the B BLM chapters in, in my neck of the woods in the Ohio and et cetera. That political education per se, that was very strong aspect at power and revolutionary groups of the 60s um, seems not to be as, um, as selling it in, in, in those local organizations. And I think when you 
when and when you miss that, then you miss opportunities of more effective uh, of organizing. I can't speak on all the local organizations, but I can only speak on, on the ones that I'm that I'm familiar with in, in, in Cincinnati. Yeah, political, yeah, the political education as an ongoing systematic aspect of activism as it was for the Black Panther Party where you both had community political education and um, as well as political education for uh, the members that was a vital part. And oftentimes that gets um, um, shortchanged by some scholars with saying that it was all rote and memorization, but that not that wasn't necessarily always the case. Political education was so fundamental in many chapters. I know such as in Omaha, where I'm doing work now, connected with Des Moines, that political education was just a form of education where folks were taught how to learn how to read and write because of poor educational systems. And we see that in the 10 point party platform. So there was a great deal of emphasis on, on, on reading and organizing and applying literature to, contem to, to the contemporary times that again, I did not necessarily see in my participation and connections with um, um, the main BL, B, Black Lives Matter organization. I'd be curious this um, with Donna's um, experience has been in the Northeast. Thanks for that, Charles. Um, in terms of the Panthers themselves, I mean, in living for the city, I argue that the most important legacy of the party was political education. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that there weren't flaws or you know, uh, inconsistencies. And I can say some more about that in a minute. But one of the things I always find remarkable about the party was and is the brilliance of its members. And, you know, I come from a part of the country where I feel like it's hard to get educated. You know, at one point they were about to shut down all the high schools in the little Rust Belt city I grew up in. And so education for me, a particularly radical and counter hegemonic education, it was hard to get. A lot of it I didn't even get until I was in college or graduate school. And I was profoundly educated by the party and other people in the black radical movement. I felt like a lot of my education took place in like my late twenties and early thirties and it continues to go on. So in that sense, I'm always humble about the difficulty of transmitting our histories in the United States. Um, one, the one area that I felt uncomfortable and Emery and many other people on this call know more about this is there was a period where Mario Puzo was being assigned in some political education. I found the documents inside the Huey P. Newton archive. And that was hard for me <laughs> to say it like that. And it seemed inconsistent because I think there was a lot of you know, profound education using Fanon, using Lenin, using Karl Marx, using um, Robert Allen, you know, there was such a rich, rich corpus of political education. I think today, one of the biggest problems, the reason I keep bringing up organizational models is that in doing the research on the movement for black lives and also having attended a lot of the convenings going on in Chicago with the amazing Barbara Ransby and sister Kathy Cohen, you know, seeing this multi-generational people participating in this and the Ford Foundation and a lot of the a lot of the philanthropy has become so central to how education is done. And the biggest thing that I one of the biggest things that stands out to me about the party is by being a membership based organization that funded itself also through its newspaper through its I found uh, as I was researching my book on crack and the war on drugs, I found a whole list of revolutionary publications that the party sold like including capitalism plus dope equals genocide, which was sold for 25 cents. And I read about Brother Emery's uh, efforts in using that pamphlet to organize. So a lot of the way that political education was done, it was a self-funded effort. And I know that it's hard to do this today, but the problem is when you are funded, and this did happen with the vision for black lives and within the movement, there was a large part of that that was philanthropically funded. And I think 
while we want to make sure people can survive and get jobs, it also redirects the nature of how the education is done and who it's addressing. So that piece, you know, in addition to the content, um, I think is crucial is it being self-funding also means self-determination mm. and choosing non-commercial, you know, what happens with philanthropy is also it shapes how you say things and what you do in order to maintain your funding. And brother Daydan Kamati, rest in power uh, in Los Angeles, you know, who was such an important and profound organizer. He talked about this all the time, being basically offered money to stop, start a not-for-profit and refusing it because of the way that he knew it would divert your attention. Sophie? Yes, thank you. I was only going to add, as we've been discussing, how much political education the BPP did versus how much political education BLM is doing. I want to also uplift the fact that not only was there PE inside the BPP, but the BPP went out into the community. I know the small high school town that I grew up in, the BPP showed up at my high school and took it over routinely and did PE classes right in the auditorium. That shaped my life forever. And I know it shaped many of the lives of the, of the people that I went to school with. And so their commitment to political education wasn't insular, it was community-wide. Well, thank you, thank you. You got something else in there? Well, we do, but we've got 13 minutes left. And so I wanna make sure that we, we have a conversation about um, Eddie, if we can. <laughs> So if we can, can you go ahead and try one or two more questions? Okay. Um, because the thing I have on Eddie is gonna be fairly quick. Um, but if we can, and, and guys, if we can, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut, let y'all answer the questions. <laughs> well, and I, all right, so we're gonna do that. So I have, this was another question that came up earlier and I wanna tell you all again, that the chat is your friend. There's been a great string of conversations going on in the chat and um, we will have all of that on the website when we post the from this call so people will be able to see that again but this is a question for donna merch and it was asking about you to share details about your travels to cuba and um and and whether or not you you they're presuming that you did meet with asada shakur and so they're asking like how did that happen did it happen nothing uh-oh yeah they they uh -oh. I'm sorry, I have once again muted myself. It's just a habit, so I don't create any background noise. I wish that I had been able to get to Cuba to see Asada. I was actually working on doing it over a number of years, but most of this book is written during the tail end of the Obama administration and then during the Trump administration. And my understanding is that in many ways, Asada, Asada's safety has been a real, issue and the threat of extradition is probably, especially during those four years of Trump, but still today is probably greater than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. So I wish I could, um, I wish I had had that opportunity. Okay, great. So I think those are the two questions that I saw and, and, and Roz and April can text me anything else that you saw. They were long, um, a little bit longer than that, but there's anything else. I saw tons of, of comments. So, um, and I do want to acknowledge also that we have on the call in Zinga Nomo, who is the owner of Afroware Books. She's also on the call today. We like to be able to acknowledge our Black booksellers. In addition to that, April um, did post um, a list of Black booksellers, as far as we know. So there's a link for that too. So we just always encourage folks when you can buy from a Black bookseller. Got All it. right. Thank you. All right. So, so look, I'll, I'll, Nat, do you have access? Do you need a few minutes to pull up the uh, letter? No, I have it. I have the it. Statement. Can, can you read that, please? Sure. So, okay. so this is dealing with Eddie, and so that we can all um, embrace this. Right. And this is coming from Don, Dominique Conway, Eddie's wife. Okay. Greeting friends and comrades. We write today to ask for your prayers and support for our beloved Marshall Eddie Conway, who has fallen ill over the past few weeks. 
Eddie is currently hospitalized and will need long-term care and support for his healing and recovery. We are reaching out to the vast community of folks who love Eddie to ask that you send prayers for his swift and total recovery. We are also fundraising to cover medical expenses and ask that you please give if you are able to offset the cost of transferring Eddie to a rehabilitation facility. You can make a donation and we should put this in the chat. I can do that, but there's two ways to do it to do a donations. One is to do a cash app. I will put that in there to, to WP Coats or PayPal to bcpdigital at gmail.com. We know Eddie will pull through this as he has with many other challenges in his life, thanks to the ancestors, family, and community. We ask that you please respect his immediate family's need for space at this time to, to tend to Eddie's care. Please reach out to Erica Woodland. I will have her email address, which is ewoodland at gmail.com. If you have questions or additional offerings of support, all power to the people. Okay. So, so the, the thing that I want to make sure that we leave this call with is Eddie is doing okay. He's recovering. Uh, all of his vital signs are good. The doctors project he, that he will recover. He's, he's had some challenges. Um, and I don't want to particularly speak on, on uh, his medical condition at this point, because I think that's the family space. But I can tell you that it is, we're not expecting him to leave us anytime soon, okay? Uh, but his recovery will take a while, just muscular, to, to get him back up to shape. And so that's really what that is. The other thing I will ask people to do is to, for, for at least a while, please, many people on this call know Eddie and you got his number, don't call him, okay? Because one, he's not, he's not answering his phone, he can't get to it, and the family is burdened by trying to get back to people. Uh, if you would, do not call Dominique right now. They need the space to deal with Eddie. Um, just to tell you, Eddie is in North Carolina and the money that's being raised is used, being used to transport him back to Baltimore medically, okay? So we're gonna have to have some medical transportation. We have been in contact with the comrades in North Carolina who, um, uh, who, have, who have helped with some things, but ultimately uh, his wife, Dominique, who, who was his long-term supporter while he was incarcerated, is managing this and is gonna get this through. So I just want to let you guys know that. I want to especially make sure that we leave this on as upbeat as we can because Eddie is cool. He really, really is cool. We fully, fully expect him to be out there collecting coats again, giving it to kids, doing the free food giveaways and all of the things that he came out of jail doing. Um, so that's what we have for right now on Eddie. Natalie is putting the information into the chat, particularly take Erica's number. People that have my email can communicate with me. I won't be able to say anything beyond the statement, but I can give references, okay? To the extent that I can. That's well, I, really what the deal is. Yeah, I, and I have posted that over there. It's with the information that Dominique sent. And at the end of it, there are the links for that. And then there's also a link um, if they want to contact with the Gmail addresses on there. Um, and so I want to let you all know that that is, that's already been posted. So that's on the side. And we've got about six minutes left. Paul, I, Paul, I, look, I know you, we've been talking great stuff, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention to everybody that um, as soon as we can get it printed, and yes, I know we are a printing company. Um, I want to, I want to do this really quick. Uh, cause I'm excited about it. Y'all like, we don't care if she's excited about something, <laughs> but <laughs> I want to share that the COINTEL pro papers, which was done by Ward Churchill and Jim Vander. Oh, Jim Vander wall. Oh my gosh. We got to change that. Um, as well as the agents of repression are being republished by black classic press. So as soon as we can get those things out, they will be available. I just wanted to say we've been working on this. Um, there's a little bit of a new introduce, uh, introduction by Ward, Ward Churchill. I'm falling over my words here. So that is what's new in the book, but we are republishing this book. And I just had to 
just had to share that before folks got off. No, I, th I think that's so great. Actually, we're, she's not the only person excited. I'm excited about it. Um, these books, uh, particularly Agents of Repression, uh, gave us, like as Panthers, and Emory knows this inside, and everybody on this call, everybody that's a Panther know this, we always knew that the feds were there and that other people were there, they were watching, we're in this war with them. And we knew we were there until the end, but we had no idea, no idea of the forces that we were up against. And fortunately, the work that Ward Churchill did, Jim Vanderwall did, brought together documents that gave us really for the first time an opportunity to see the depth of uh, forces that were arrayed against us. So I'm real excited about it. Um, uh, Ward's introduction, I find to be a very, very substantial introduction. And the great part about this is I consulted with Emory on doing this cover, okay? <laughs> because I thought it would be poetic to have Emory's cover on this book because we are still exposing their butts, okay? Um, Emory um, and I worked together and we got actually someone who Emory helped train who was in the party, brother Steve Long did the covers. So I, I thought it's, it's like really cool that we have uh, Panthers involved in keeping this information alive for another generation. Uh, we fully expect to have, uh, there are a lot of images in both books and in printing them, we've encountered some challenges with them, but I think we've got them pretty much resolved. These books were supposed to be in the store this month, okay? And before the end of the month, our intention is that they will be, they'll be available. People wanna order, you can go to our, our site and um, get the books. Charles, Sophia, Donna, we're going to close actually with statements from you guys. Um, and, and Sophia, can I ask if you will close us out, if you'll take the last statement? Uh, because it's, it's so much and what have you. So Donna, Charles, if, if you guys have last words to share with us, please do. I, I would just like to... Um... Again, thank you, Paul, and Black Class to Press, your excellent staff for putting the, putting this program together. And um, I would like to thank all the party members from over the years. I've probably interviewed 65 or so party members from across the country. Um, interviewed Bill Brent in, in Cuba at one time and Brother Don Cox in, um, in, in Paris. I, I just want to um, thank all of them, the brothers and sisters, for um, allow me to um, utilize um, their work, their stories um, in my work. And I also want to um, give a nod to one of the most lasting but unexplored legacy of the Black Power Movement, and that has been um, political prisoners. So I, I want us all to remember the political prisoners who are still sacrificing for their participation in, in, in And that's all. Thank you. Um, I would like to follow exactly what Charles said. I would like to thank all the party members for their generosity and brilliance from which I continue to learn. And it was so meaningful, me, meaningful me, for me to be here. And I wanted to thank you, Paul, for Black Classic Press, as well as organizing this space and so many others. And thank Charles for you know, giving me the first, besides the autobiographies, the first, the first thing that I read about the party that really taught me about the whole national party and how to think about it and frame it in black history and black radical tradition. And I just continually draw inspiration for the party. I really do. And my, my sincere hope is to see organizing. I think that is in direct line and spirit of the party I think that there are elements of it, but I'm old school, but I would love to see another party <laughs> with party-based organization that with a direct lineage, because I think we need parties. I really do. I think that as an organizational form, so much was accomplished and I see it as a form that I would love to see taken up by 
our generations and future generations. Got it. Sophia, can you, um, as Donna waves her book, can you wave your book, Donna? <laughs> Again, congratulations. And, and, and Sophia, if you can take us out, the, the Charles and Donna, I just wanna say this. Um, you guys represent a particular type of scholarship. I am so grateful and thankful to the work you're doing. Charles, the ground you broke open, Karen is on the call, Karen's on the call, and so many other black scholars. You cats own this highway. You know, it, it really is, you guys are telling the story unlike any other chapter in our history you are telling the story of our resistance and you dominate it. So I really thank you for the efforts that you've put into this, the energy and Charles for all of the young cats that you, brothers and sisters that you've spawned over the years and helped along um, over the years. Uh, I really thank you for, for your efforts and the work that you guys continue to do and for the lessons that you've established. Sophia, can you take us home? Yes, first I wanna echo what you said, Paul, to Donna and Charles. It's a pleasure to share the virtual platform with you all. I've read your work and I'm inspired. It's, um, it's refreshing to be able to read about our struggle written by people who care about it. That's extremely important. Um, I also want to say thank you to you, Paul, and to everyone Black Classic Press for giving an opportunity to elevate Sundiata's situation. Again, as our elder at 85 years old, we need to be doing everything within our power to get him out of prison and all the other political prisoners whose health is compromised. People literally are dying inside. We owe it to our people and we owe it to them who sacrificed so much for us to do everything possible to gain their freedom. That will be the mark of the strength of our movement. That will be the mark of the future of our liberation. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll, I'll end. I'm very mindful of the time and I'm respectful of it. Thank, thank you again. You. It's, it, thank you, sister. So Natalie, the thing that we possibly, and is when guys are still on the call, when guys, if you're on the call, would you make yourself present, please? Um, um, but Natalie, the thing that we possibly can do is supply Sophia with the registration list from this call. Okay, okay. not a problem. Yep. Sophia, that will give you direct access to the people who are on, who registered for the call. Okay. Uh, some are not on the call, but to the people who registered for this call so that you can update them with um, um, the current, you know, whatever is current about Sundiata. People on the call, your, your registration is going over to Sophia. If you do not want to receive emails, just block them all. That's the way to do it. But let's keep this going uh, strong. Did Wangaza come in? She is there, but her video is, 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 Okay, do I have an audio gotcha. with one guy? You do have audio. We do have okay. audio. So look, this is a little bit different. We opened we 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 opened the program with um one Gaza, but in this case, one Gaza, I'm gonna ask you to close this program. And I'm gonna ask people as one Gaza is talking for us to again bring present all of those who have left us, all of those who are incarcerated all of those whose shoulders we stand on. And when Gaza, if you could just close with a few words, we will end this call. So I want to um, acknowledge the circle that has been generated and that will continue to be generated because we were here together virtually in our heads, in our hearts. I want to acknowledge each of you who participated in a historic conversation that furthers the well-being of our people. It furthers our history. It teaches us, it gives us pathways to important lessons, lessons that were learned by the Panther Party through prisoners of war, 
that this generation and subsequent generations do not have to repeat. And so we are in that way jollies, those who have written the history, lived the history, and therefore offered sacred, sacred lessons. In this moment, we thank God Almighty for it, for us and for what is to come. For each and every fallen panther, for each and every want to be panther, for those who walk with our panthers, for those who are incarcerated, we put our arms around them because we're putting our arms around ourselves and we say, thank you. Continue to walk with us, continue to guide us, and we will continue to do the work. Yes, with sir. that in mind, we go forth and do exactly that. It's an honor. Be well. Thank everyone for being on this call. Nat, you have the ability to close out.